Hello, hello. Happy Halloween, everybody. How are you all doing today? I'm hoping the Nightbot behaves later on, but happy Halloween, everybody. Hello, Zep. Hello, Sharky. Hello, Choso. How are you doing today? <laughs> and a happy Halloween or whatever you celebrate today, if you celebrate it. <laughs> yeah, we got back from trick-or-treating a while ago. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm hoping we don't get any knocks at the door, which sets the doggo off. He was barking earlier because they've been letting fireworks off too, so that's, that's going to be good. <laughs> I'm doing... Well, I've just taken some pain meds because uh, to, earlier today I went to have some surgery done on my arm. Um... You know, for my, uh, ba, 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 ba. oh, what's it called? Oh, God, what is it called? Um, oh, I forget what it's called. My, uh, implant in my arm. <laughs> I've got a couple others I can throw out there. Happy, oh, God, I, I will hopefully not butcher these. Happy Dia de la Muertes Eve and happy day before candy goes on sale. Yes. Ah, reduced candy. Boxing day. Day after Valentine's Day, um, day after Mother's Day and Father's Day, and day after Halloween. Like, things always go on sale. I love it. Oh, Sarah just DM me a happy Halloween. Oh, bless. Oh, ha Halloween has been pretty alright, to, to, to be honest. Um, it didn't rain this year. Todos los Santos Eve. Ah, thank you, Choso. Thank you. <laughs> Dia de Muertes y no is November 2nd. Oh, I love learning. I need to, I want to have a look. Do we have a saying for Happy Halloween in uh, Welsh? Let me have a look, see. Doggos might be a bit angsty. We do. So, um, Happy Halloween in Welsh is... Kalan Geev Hapis. Hmm. Gaev, I think is pronounced, yes. Gaev. Kalan Gaev Hapis. Happy Halloween. <laughs> yes. We ha I saw some really cool decorations as well. Um, out and about today. Uh, there's some fireworks going off. I saw some kids dressed as giant T-Rexes and inflatable sharks, and that was really cool. It is the... is it the second this year? I could have sworn it was the first and second. I think it's the second. The first is always Day of Autumn. Oh, do you do extra things in November associated to it? That's really cool. I like that. But yeah, we have my yearly tradition. For those who are new to my community, Mr. Doge, no. We're not doing this today, Mr. Dojin. You're being very rude to everyone. <laughs> you might get spooked by an occasional bark today. But yeah, I'm, I'm not too bad. I'm recovering from uh, some minor surgery on my arm today. So I'm all patched up. i got to keep a bandage on it for like two days. Um... Well, the stitches uh, heal. Um, and I've taken some pain meds for them. So that's all fun. <laughs> okay. Spain has Days of All Saints as a national holiday. Halloween is related to All, all Hallows Eve. Ah, ah, okay. Okay, that's really cool. I like learning new things. You know this. I love learning about everybody else's culture. <laughs> I'm super duper excited. Um, but yes, today is Halloween. And uh, for those who don't know, uh, Halloween is a standing tradition since before I became a VTuber. Um, I would read um, creepypasta stories in my Discord server. And every year it is, uh, you know, not just been, you know, it's grown from just being the Discord server to being on uh, Twitch as well. I did it last year, um, not long after I debuted. So today is like my second time doing it on Twitch. So I'm super duper excited. 
to share it all with you. Um, and reading stories for my Discord community is sort of what pushed the community to be like, no, Sammy, you should try doing this on Twitch. And I've also seen some progress from my dear Aki on the new PNG, so I'm super duper excited. I have drunk my tea. So that is always important. We like tea in this house. The version of it is F. F. Oh god, it's up 14. Final Fantasy 14. Okay. <laughs> Played it last year during the year's ASW. Oh, that's so exciting! But also. We have things we're raising money for, as always. Um, I told the nurses in the hospital today to keep my mind off um, the needles and uh, of the anesthesia and stuff today. Um, all about my, my Twitch and I was raising money and they were super proud of me and excited for me. And I was like, yay! <laughs> very, very exciting. But we are raising money for cancer research and we're aiming to get that £300 done by the end of the year. So far we're at 195 of 300 so to be honest, I'm very very proud of myself and everybody in the community for supporting. Um, and then obviously we're working on our uh, rigging as well and we've got so many new little plushies to hang about with. Um, you know I got Tigra uh, and Death as a new plushie and Scion's plushie has been updated as well so I'm super duper excited for that. But yeah, we, we didn't get many trick-or-treaters while we were out, so, you know, because we couldn't find a pumpkin last minute. <laughs> I saw some really cool uh, decorated houses, um, but we're going to be reading stuff from the Creepypasta Collection Volume 2. Um, you know, and it's a, book that, it's a book that has been edited by Mr. Creepypasta. Um, I own both of these books. You can get them on Amazon and I highly recommend doing so if you enjoy creepypastas. Um, I, I'm slowly wanting to collect them all if there's any more out there. Work just ended. I've got to run a couple errands real quick. Of course, Seth, of course, honey. You know, don't don't mind us. You do what you need to do, sweetie. Um, it's going to be one of those karma streams today, cozy streams. We do like cozy streams. I've got my jellyfish bookmark. I'm very, very happy with that. <laughs> I hope people have got themselves all cozied up for this evening. You got yourself something to drink, blankets, candies, whatever it is you need. Doggo is playing with his toys. We've got some, you know, Halloween music. Karma stream. Well, the music is having a fucking panic attack. I specifically picked these out to give horror and scary vibes get that those hearts pumping you know a bit of fear you know does it make you feel like you're being chased there chozo <laughs> i say calm in the terms of you'll hear my lovely voice reading you nice stories but i didn't say the stories were going to be pleasant stories did i <laughs> but we are going to be reading some creepypastas. As you know, there will be a disclaimer. For those who don't know about creepypastas, they are horror stories. They are gory stories. The contents of the stories are meant to shock, disgust, and disturb you. So I don't want nobody getting triggered or offended. I will pre-warn you that the stories are of a not-so-safe nature in terms of, you know... I think it'd be best if we made a little trigger warning, don't you reckon? And pin it up there. PW Gore Horror. And Uncomfy Pockets in Creepy Pasta Tales. You have been warned! listen at your own discretion I say that now because I don't want somebody saying that they are ups upset 
you know, I'll, I'll repin this up there. There we go. So, you know, I don't want people getting upset. We do mean triggered in the medical sense. No one gets to be a wise ass about it. These stories can have really upsetting themes. Indeed. Very, very true indeed, Chozo. Um, and I give this warning every single year as well uh, when I read these stories um, to my community because everybody goes through a lot of stuff these days. Uh, not People get squeamish. People can get very disturbed by horror stories and stuff like that because uh, they're very descriptive <laughs> um, I don't want to put people off obviously when they come in but some people are not aware of what creepypasta tales are some people are not accustomed to it and I want to at least make sure you get an idea of the stuff that you could possibly hear in these stories like you know there will be terms of like murder there will be you know gore monsters a lot of blood um maybe creepy behaviors of people listening to a lot of stories by ck walker after finishing boraska and she writes stuff that is harrowing and there might be worse things here exactly exactly it's always nice to be open-minded and understand the realities of what content you are reading <laughs> hello rock sweet pea how you doing happy tuesday my dear are you all cozy for story time or is it a work day today, baby? But I'm just giving everybody the rundown and trigger warnings of uh, what to expect during one of my creepypasta story times. I wanted to tell you, someone took my day. Oh, they did! Oh, I'm so happy for you, honey. Days off are good. But I was just giving everybody the lowdown of hey this isn't uh, you know your typical nice nice stories be open-minded make sure you don't read something that might hurt you if those things trigger bad mental responses exactly i've read these books quite often over and over and i'm still always surprised by the stories like things like these do not bother me um which you know i could i'm one of the few who i'd say has a good tolerance and mindset for them uh, but, you know, I don't want any of you to get, you know, feel obligated to stay. If anything you hear in a story upsets you, you're more than welcome to hop off. I was... Oh, Jesus. God damn it, babe. Oh, it started. <laughs> yes, we do have sound redeems. <laughs> we have horror sound redeems for a stream. <laughs> um... We have our knocking, we have our screaming, and we have a lovely humming ghost. That one's pleasant. That No, that one wasn't you this time, Chelsea. The scream, uh, my partner loves to abuse that one. <laughs> um, I plan to leave those ones up this week. I love this one. Yeah, yeah they're free to, to use. I have them on two minute calm downs. This one was the little man is vibing. Yes, he is vibing. But I hope you guys are prepared, but also cozy for tonight's stories. Um, I do enjoy sharing stories with everybody. <laughs> and we have our plushies guarding the little bitty jar today as well. And I, this is my just chatting screen I have set up. I hope you like it so far. It's nothing grandeur, but it's, uh, you know, I worked hard on it. But if you guys are cozy and comfy, then I shall begin with tonight's first story. It's called Your Secret Admirer. <laughs> I'm writing to tell you how I really feel. You probably didn't notice... But for the longest time, I've always been there for you. I want you to know what I've done. And I hope by me opening up to you like this, you will feel the same way for me. And we can be happy together forever. I remember when we were both 13 years old, when you first transferred to my school. As soon as you walked in, I thought you were the most beautiful girl in the world. When your tranquil blue eyes crossed mine, even though it was for a brief moment as you scanned across the strange faces in the class i wanted to be with you forever 
I was heartbroken straight away though, when you were paired off with some other guy to show you around the school. You didn't really notice me much. You were always with your group of friends who were so, so different from mine. Who am I kidding? I never really had any friends. The one thing that got me through all those years of loneliness in school was watching you, admiring everything you did. The way you gracefully went through your day without faults simply left me in awe day in and day out. As the years went by, you seemed pretty popular with both the guys and the girls. You were sought after by the popular guys in the school, even by some of the older ones. But you shrugged them off. The girls loved how you looked after yourself. You always had your makeup and hair perfect, which made you admired but hated. It's sad, but it's human nature to get jealous. And we are all guilty of this crime. What they ended up doing, however, was far out of line. I saw as they pushed you when the teachers weren't looking. They would shove you into any nearby object, which more often than not was not the wall. When you stumbled and slammed into the wall, the teachers would simply turn and say, watch where you're going, dear, and go about their business, blissfully unaware of what actually happened. Witnessing it happen every other day burned me up inside, seeing you have this torment for being better than them. It was painful to watch every time it happened. I hoped it would die down, but it got worse. I saw when the bullies would knock your drink over when you weren't expecting it, just because the most popular guy asked you out. I was there when they set your bag on fire in the woodwork class because they thought you were being condescending when you tried to help them with their work. And I caught a glimpse of the one time they actually threw you to the ground outside the school gate and kicked you until you cried, simply because you tried to tell the teacher about what they were doing. After that incident, they followed you home. Usually they wouldn't do anything but yell abuse at you. The worst part was never knowing when they'd snap and suddenly attack you. It tore me apart to see the girl I love, loved feel so vulnerable. I wanted to fix it. I knew there were three main bullies that were consistent. I knew of more, but they seemed to only do it out of peer pressure. The main culprit was that narcissistic whore, Bethany. Beth was jealous of everything about you. All the things I mentioned that made you great burned her up inside. She used to be the centre of attention and my gosh did she love it. All the guys wanted to be with her and all the girls wanted to be her. The only difference is that she used it for her own personal gain and ultimately abused it. She slept with most of the guys who showered her in gifts and their mummies and daddies paid that their mummies and daddies paid for. She only hung around with the girls she deemed lower than herself and demeaned them so they wouldn't be a threat to her god complex. But slowly, over the years of you being in the school, she eventually lost her reputation, because then all that the attention was on you. The second deviant, who had a disgruntled grudge against you, was that asshole Chris. He asked you to go to the school's annual dance in front of both his friends and yours, and you simply rejected him, like the many others. But what made this instance different was that he ran off crying. He was publicly embarrassed, which in school meant a lot. He denied liking you and lost his friends and reputation. So he took out his frustrations on who he thought caused all of it, you. The last person was Julie. She had it bad for you ever since the guy she liked always talked about how amazing you were while not paying attention to her, even after she performed some, well, let's say desperate deeds for him. During the last week of school, I knew they had something special planned for you. So I took it into my hands to deal with it because I love you and I didn't want your last few days at school to be ruined. The first person I convinced not to mess with you anymore was Chris. Now, he was much stronger than me, being into all the school sports, plus the alleged steroids, 
meant I would not be able to take him in a simple one-on-one -on -one fight. But in the end, that would be his downfall. I knew where he kept his steroids. It wasn't hard to figure out. Since our school's security and reputation was so low, there was no need to hide it. I got his locker's combination by saying I forgot mine. The teacher handed over a list of everyone's combination. Yeah, that's right. They have no sense of security in this school. <laughs> I cracked open his locker with ease, leaving no trace of it ever being opened. I found the next shot he was going to use and squirted a little bit out, then pulled the plunger back out to where it was, leaving a considerable sized air bubble. I figured Chris was no doctor, nor does he have a clue how things work. He simply injects himself, then trains in the school gym. I bought a pass for the gym and watched as I pretended to train. He eventually came in the gym, laughing hysterically with his friends. Enjoy it while you can. It's not going to last long, was the thought that cropped up into my head. He went to his locker and not long later came out dressed up in his training attire with a determined look on his face. He was ready to start. He was fine for a while, but eventually slowed down. He had a puzzled look on his face as his body slowly gave up. And eventually, cardiac arrest set in and he was on the floor. People tried CPR, but there was no defibrillator. Oh god, that word. Defibrillator. Oh my god. There was no defibrillator around since it was a school full of teenagers. Who would expect a heart attack in a place like this? I smiled and walked out before the paramedics arrived. It was already too late for him. Working my way down the list, Julie was next. She was always jealous of the way every guy liked you. I silently slipped through her window without her noticing. I knew her parents were out, so if she made a noise, no one would immediately come to her aid. I pounced on her while she was sleeping and pinned her down. I tied her hands to the bedposts and then her legs. I pulled out several jars from my bag, each one almost black. Upon closer inspection, if you looked carefully at the gaps, you would see small movements. They were full of all the creepy crawlies one would typically find in the bottom of anyone's garden. I took my time filling these up with every insect I could find. I wanted her to understand the pain you must have felt all that time she was shouting abuse at you, hurting you, making you feel lower than you really are. I propped her mouth open with one of those plastic rings a dentist would use for a long procedure. I slowly poured each jar down her throat. Every time she her screaming, was muffled a little further by the buzzing and scuttling noises the bugs were making as they adjusted to their new home. Tears streamed down her face as I repeated how all of this was for you. A few jars in and I could feel the bugs in her stomach where I was sitting the whole time. By this time she had pretty much passed out from the pain. When this happened I'd wait, pour water on her face and slap her until she responded. For punishment, I'd take off the ring from her mouth and pour the water down her throat, making her swallow the insects and causing them to go on a frenzy of panic. Eventually, during the fifth jar, the pain of all the insects burrowing into her internal organs, plus all the internal bleeding, caused her to pass away, but not peacefully, of course. I saved the worst until last. I had something special planned for Bethany. She was by far the worst to you. She made your life a living hell and this was unacceptable. No one as perfect as you should ever have to have had the displeasure of even knowing these people. So I carefully set the pieces and waited. One day I skipped my last class but no one noticed, not even the teacher. This shows how much attention I got in school. By this time, I had memorized her route home. I waited in an archway I knew she walked past every day. 
I waited and thought about what I was going to do and how it was all for you. When I caught sight of her, I grabbed her and pulled her to the ground. She was kicking and screaming, but at this point in her journey home, there was no one around. The archway was to an abandoned, derelict church. I dragged her away from the path and toward the building so no witnesses would intervene and no one would find her body any time soon. I did my routine of tying her arms and legs to secure posts so I knew there wouldn't be much of a struggle. I also gagged her as I knew she would be making a lot of noise for what I was about to do. I slowly pulled out my knife making sure she caught sight of its shiny glimmer. I placed the point of it on her lower leg and smiled as she reacted to the sharp point of the blade. I slowly pushed down making sure the wound was clean as it slipped into her flesh. It took a while but eventually the knife's handle was touching her skin. I took my time pulling it out making sure the wound did not rupture with that easily recognised crimson liquid. That would have meant her death and that would be too easy. As soon as the tip of the knife exited her body, I immediately wrapped the, sp wrapped the split up with a bandage applying enough pressure to cut down the bleeding to a minimum. I then placed the knife a little higher up her leg, doing the same thing. I stared into her eyes as she helplessly watched me do this over and over, all over her body. After every stab, I would say a remark about how you didn't deserve what she did to you. Eventually, her whole body was nothing but red bandages. She was barely conscious as I slipped the final blow below her heart, or through her heart. I can imagine you're screaming about now. In fact, I know you will be. Oh my god. <laughs> and I will be close enough to hear you. And by you stopping, I know you've gotten to this point in my letter, so I'll start making my way in. It's pretty easy to get into your house now, after doing it so many times. You probably thought it was your parents who left this letter in your room in the first place. No, it was me. Don't be afraid of the noise downstairs. It's only me. Put down the phone. I know by now you've got it in your hand. I cut the phone line. Don't bother calling your parents. I've already silenced them. You can stop your screaming now. I'm most likely right outside your door. Unlock it now and soon it will be just you and me. Together forever. Lots of love. Your secret admirer. <laughs> that scream was fucking timed so well. Instead of me actually yelling, I, I found that one quite funny. I was like, oh, he timed us so well. It escalated quickly. <laughs> it did. It did. Rock's just like, oh my god. Defibrillators are not for heart attacks. They're for slowing down hearts at being too fast. Yep. I've been watching too much Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> the other narrator may not like Beth too much. The school having no sense of security. Yeah, what, what you know, has security these days? <laughs> Tends to be more eerie. I just picked the best little music I liked. That was, you know, copyright free. <laughs> oh, I hope you enjoyed that one. That one was really funny. I say funny. It's, it's more like, it's very cliche of, uh, Oh yes, good food, because we like to eat here. I I like that one. A little got a bit of creepiness to it. It's like, but we, but it's also quite relatable because there are people like that in the world, you know. Like we're meant to be together. Like if no. <laughs> oh dear. Very standard. I like the framing device. Hmm. It it's nice. It, it you know it leads you into. I think it, that's one of the more softer types of creepy pastas you can get. It's like 
Oh yeah, creepy psycho stalker murderer person. It's more, it leads more into the Yandere effect, I get, you know? It's like, oh, someone absolutely obsessed with somebody. You're a Yandere, you know? You okay there, Rock? You're all cryy. <laughs> Oh, our next one is called Bubbles, and it's written by Max Lobdell. Very well restrained to limit things to the perception of the narrator. Hmm. I like how it was written in like letter format. Like, I love reading books that contain letters from people. There, there was a book I read many years ago. It was a, it was about like people on an island's like life but as well as romance and stuff and bonds uh, between people and every single page was in a letter format like it had the address the header who it was to the date and who it was signed by it was really nice didn't set to invent the wheel or anything just good hearty food damn right you know you gotta be fed to function you know? Love when the narration style changes because of context. A letter, someone recounting a story. Yes. There was a creepy pasta story in the first book a while ago. And it was a mix of normal, like, story esque, like writing. And then the others were, like, transcript documentations from um, a case study they were working on. And it was really fascinating like there was um they also like had um radio interviews and stuff like that all written down in a really nice format but yeah it's super fun i, I love nerding out about writing styles with people <laughs> even when it comes to scary ones I'm in the process of writing a, like a, a dark horror type themed story. Um, not really sure where I'm going with it though, but like I just sort of ramble with it. I was talking to my mum today though. She's writing um, a book as well uh, herself and she keeps going to me, how do you get over writer's block? I went, you're asking somebody sat in a writer's block right now and it's it's hard to shake, to be honest. <laughs> but are you ready for your next tale? <laughs> oh, I'm having fun. But yes, these are collections of creepy tales um, that Mr. Creepypasta compiled. He edited it. Uh, so they contain different stories, and this one's Bubbles by Max Lobdell. I'm going to dip my toes in horror writing. Can't pass it by my family or my best friend. They're not really horror. Hey, pass it by me anytime, Chozo. I absolutely love reading uh, people's work. And, you know, my, my Discord server is mainly creative-based anyway. That's why it was made in the first place. So you're always welcome to, you know, pass by things to me. I love it. Plus, I'm going to be hosting a, starting a new uh, creative event for November. So you can either dabble in some writing or, you know, artwork, whatever the prompt word may be. And it's all for fun. So keep your eye out on the Discord channel for that tomorrow. <laughs> oh, I need to make sure I'm not slouched in my chair. Mm. Oh, dear. So yes, as I said, our next tale is Bubbles by Max Lobdell. Why does that sound like such a cute title <laughs> for a story? All right. So, I was getting my hand stitched up in the ER last night when a series of rapid beeps sounded on the intercom, followed by an announcement of ABD. Code A, Bay 1. 
Every doctor and nurse in the area stopped what they were doing and rushed to the main ER entrance. They got there just in time to meet the ambulances. I couldn't see anything, so I waited. I figured there had to have been a serious accident. My phone rang. It was Lucy, my wife. She asked how my hand was. I told her they were still stitching it up. I apologised for getting blood all over her bagel and she laughed and reminded me that she'd told me not to cut it that way. There was a pause while Lucy answered one of the kids' questions in the background. Then she came back on the line and asked if I saw that really bright light about a half hour ago. I didn't know what she was talking about, so she went on. It was crazy bright. The whole sky was this weird pastel pink colour. Then it turned white. It almost hurt to look at it. It was so bright. Huh, I replied. Maybe it was a UFO. I craned my neck to see over the mass of people still huddled by the ambulance bay. Still nothing. Lucy laughed. Yeah, must have been aliens. She said something to one of the kids again, then came back on the line. Okay, I'm going to go. Joey said he's about to throw up. I said goodbye and ended the call. The commotion on the other end of the ER was growing as more people from other parts of the hospital arrived. Something smelled terrible. I covered my nose and mouth with my shirt and stood up. I walked over to the window so I could get a better look at what was happening. The crowd had thinned slightly. I saw a few nurses running off, probably to pick up supplies. At the end of the hall were two gurneys, with medical personnel hovering over them. The smell got worse and I gagged inside my shirt. One of the gurneys began to move as someone pushed it down the hall. I stood in the doorway and watched. As the victim came into view, my eyes widened. It was a young woman, covered from head to toe, in what I could only describe as bubbles. Some were as small as a pea, others were the size of a grapefruit. They all throbbed and pulsated from some pressure inside them, and every so often one would tear open and weep yellow fluid onto the gurney. The smell was overwhelming. They pushed her into a room next to mine. I could see everything from the window in the wall. They didn't bother closing the curtains. I heard the other gurney being pushed by and glanced over at it. A girl, maybe 12 or 13. I shuddered. I directed my gaze back at the person in the adjacent room. The doctors were popping bubbles to insert an IV. Fluid oozed onto the floor and I used every bit of self-control I could muster to avoid throwing up. The woman's eyes were wide and darting back and forth. It was an expression of terror, terror and agony, as if sensing my stare, thin stalk slid from the centre of her left eye. The doctors shouted and backed up. The stalk elongated a little over a foot and its tip grew a bubble of its own. The bubble expanded and the weight caused the stalk to droop. When it was the size of an orange, it stopped growing. It hung like an obscene fruit. There was a yell from the room when they brought the other victim. I assumed it was for the same reason. On the other side of the window, more stalks emerged in a cluster from the woman's other eye. All of them produced bubbles like a bunch of grapes. My phone beeped. It was a text from Lucy. Can you go look outside? It's that light again. As if on cue, every light in the hospital went out. The emergency lights clicked on for half a second, then they went dead. There was nothing, nothing but the stream of pink light coming in from the open ambulance bay doors. I stepped in the hall and asked to no one in particular what was happening. I doubt anyone heard me, because the light shifted from pink to white. Accompanied by a blast of noise, I can only describe as static. 
It caused me to clasp my hands to my ears and retreat backwards into the room, where I cowered in the corner. I saw shadows passing in front of the white light reflecting off the floor, bizarrely shaped shadows. They moved in a way that was both jerky and fluid, like jelly suspended on bone. The shadows darkened as whatever was making them got closer. Doctors and nurses in the next room shrieked and then there was a flash that silenced them. Then, two feet away in the hall, partially illuminated from the back by the piercing white light, I saw it. My initial thought of jelly suspended on bone wasn't very far off. Six ossified tubes carried heavy, segmented portions of sloshing, semi-transparent sacks. The first thing that came to mind was the body of a jellyfish. Bubbles and waving stalks decorated the entirety of its trunk and it walked by, either not noticing me or not caring about my presence. It reached the room of the other victim, just like before there was a scream, a flash of light, and then silence. The light outside went dark. The sound stopped. The emergency lights in the hospital clicked on. I scrambled to my feet and looked through the window at the room next to me. The doctors were writhing on the ground with burns on their exposed skin. The burns didn't look life-threatening, but the woman on the gurney was gone. Nothing was left but that sticky, yellow fluid on the floor. What the fuck was that? I yelled and banged on the window. The person who'd been stitching me up got off the floor, came back into the room and asked me to sit down so he could finish. A nasty burn on the bridge of his nose wet tears of lymphatic fluid down his mouth and chin. ABD code, he said. Abduction. We've trained for them, but it was the first one I ever saw. They're not supposed to come back from for the abductees, though. I wonder why they did that. I sputtered and asked, You, you people have dealt with this? How isn't this... How isn't this going to be on the front page of every paper? Well, you'll forget about it in a couple hours. Everyone will. Better write down what you remember so you can tell your friends. You'll recall something happened, but you remote but you won't remember what it was. I looked at him, stupefied. So how could you train for something like that? And how do you know it was your first one if you can't remember? He shrugged. It's just what I told you. And good point about the other thing. He paused and I saw a series of nearly invisible faded scars around his hairline. He smiled and nodded. Very good point. <laughs> and that was the tale of Bubbles. <laughs> because of juxtaposition, my friend. Cute, unassuming title. Stomach churning horror. Yes. I love how they had mention of jellyfish in there. It's like, ah, yes, my children. My children are here. <laughs> that one was cute, though. Bit of aliens. We, we like a bit of, uh, you know, aliens going on. Oh, all right. At this point, the guy was just like, oh, well, how'd she get it? So that's something he's like, I don't know. He's He's been a witness of it, but he's like, you got to uh, write it down. Uh, I was telling I was telling Lion and Aki about uh, my, my bandaged arm and I had surgery. They went, the fuck did you do? And I was like, uh, implant change. Hello, Crucible. Happy Halloween, my darling. Are you ready to enjoy some stories today, Crucible? <laughs> I mean, 
you never know. You ne you never know if uh, you know there have been abductions we're not sure of. <laughs> if you're squeamish, crucible, you know, be warned. I got my trigger warning up as well. <laughs> How are you celebrating your Halloween, darling? Doing anything fun? Or am I the only the joy you get today? Ah. It's been so long since I've done this and I'm so happy I get to do it. We must fill up our drink though. Because it's, it's very, very hard work, my friends. I'll stream a horror game later, but nothing else tonight. Ooh, what game are you going to stream, honey? What horror game are you going to stream? I want to get Labyrinth scene at some point, just so I can play with some friends. Ooh, I've not heard of that one. I'm such a wimp when it comes to horror games, though, but, like, I can read horror horror stories and other stuff like many times over <laughs> <coughs> oh dear at least i haven't sneezed on stream yet <laughs> i'm still sneezing a lot at home i think i'm allergic to dog hair but you know see how it goes all right Let's read another one. So this one, this story is called Marsh Bayward Shirts. And it's by Tales of Tim. Tim has tales, yo. <laughs> my mother left me when I was young, leaving me with my overworked father and younger brother Brandon. It's not like I didn't understand why my father had to work all the time but I didn't like it. So many times I'd get home with my little brother to find a note on the fridge. Working late again, feed your brother and be in bed before eight. We had recently moved to New Jersey, a street called Haven's Cove Road. Our house was the last one before the street took a sharp turn and hit a dead end. The house was surrounded by woods. Well, I call it woods, but in truth, it was the edges of the Marsh Baywood Swamp, an expansive wilderness that my father kept telling me not to play in. It was a Tuesday. I arrived home with Brandon and found another note. Grunting, I tossed it into the trash. I flicked on the television, grabbed a bag of Cheetos and vaulted onto the couch. And then I noticed it. The back door was wide open. My father's shoes, the only pair he had, were sitting on the back porch. I jumped up and walked to the back door, spilling my Cheetos in the process. Dad, I remember calling him. But whether that was all I said escapes me. Receiving no response was surreal. While my father did work a lot, he never once ignored us while he was home. I shivered, even though the weather was hot and muggy. I walked into the yard and waved to Brandon to follow. A crumpled pair of pants lay nearby, and I knew they were my father's. He had a bad habit of scuffing the pant legs. Once again, I called for my father but got no response. I picked up Brandon. When I stepped through the foliage, separating the yard from the swamp, I found my father's hat and tie. I walked on for maybe 15 minutes before reaching a part of the swamp where I could go no farther. The swampy water had become too deep and the risk of drowning was too high. I would have to turn around and call the police. My father was out there somewhere and my calling was doing nothing. And it, all it did was just scare my younger brother who was by now sitting on my shoulders. This area of the swamp was peculiar, but I didn't notice it until I looked up to see how late it was getting. 
About 20 feet above us hung men's dress shirts. I counted 16 white, pressed and clean shirts, nailed to trees deep in the Marsh Baywood Swamp. It was one of the most disturbing things I'd seen and I immediately decided to turn and head back. I tried calling out once more and this time I got a response. Once again, I can't be sure of the exact words, but I'll try my best. She just wants to decorate her new home. I'll be okay. Go home and make your brother some dinner. I spun to see my father climbing a tree a little distance ahead. In the area I couldn't travel to because of the water. Dad, come on. Let's go home. You're scaring me. I watched as the skin of his leg caught on a branch leaving a long scratch that immediately started to bleed. My father ignored it as he kept climbing. She's going to get mad if you stay. You need to go. Go home. I'm just helping her decorate. He reached into a knot in the side of the tree and pulled out a long metal nail. He leaned against the tree and pressed the tip of the nail to his chest with a smile. That is good. Oh, I'm so glad. It was as though he was talking to someone, but no one was there except us. They're leaving. It's okay. You don't need to. He paused. All right. My younger brother gripped my head and pointed to the water that had begun to bubble. The swamp began to get darker, even though I swore we had another hour of sunlight left. My skin began to crawl as the bubbling became more violent. I told you she'd be mad. You should leave. Go. My father's voice became more frantic and urgent, though it still had an air of calm happiness. It was like he wanted to yell but couldn't. My younger brother started to cry as we stared at the bubbling water. A lone hand reached up from its depth. A hand attached to an arm long enough to reach branches higher than I was tall. Run, my father's cheery voice again. Another hand burst from the water, followed by another and another, each of them grabbing branches. Whatever was down there was pulling itself out. Run! A low gurgling scream emitted from the water, growing in volume. I watched transfixed by the number of hands that were sliding out from beneath the dark waters of the swamp. My younger brother was yanking on my hair. He wanted to run, but I couldn't move. Run! This time, my father's voice was different. It was urgent, it was frantic, and it was a yell. I immediately snapped out of my trance and turned to run. I could hear the thing behind me trying to give chase through the dense trees. I burst into the backyard and slammed the back door behind me. I put Brandon on the couch, grabbed a kitchen knife and opened the door to the backyard. Nothing was there, aside from my father's shoes arranged near the door. My father was never found. When I took the police back to where I had found my father, the only thing we found were the shirts. The 16 that were there before, 12 new ones, and my father's hanging by an iron nail. (laughs) Oh, I like that one. That one was fun. Got more ants. Oh no, not the ants. Oh, there it goes. Nightbox decided to work now. Got one kind of right. Let's have a look, see. Uh, Right now. The dad is either in a psychotic break, a werewolf, or self-terminating. Oh my god. You did, you did. Damn. It was deep. I think he had to appease the swamp monster. The swamp monster likes men. Hence all the shirts. It's like, no, no, you can have this one. I want this one. They've come to take my new shirt from me. How dare. Decorates 
the f the swamp with new um <laughs> must have been a long af nail yes specific nails made by the swamp monster had a lot of arms though as well that was really cool it's like no i don't know i've seen like super ass long nails people have pulled out of car tires before and i'm like where did these nails come from? Like they're ma like massive and they get pulled out of like car tires and I'm like What are they used for? Now we fucking know <laughs> Now we know that what they're used for I'm like excuse me what? Like how dare All right What's this one? This one is called For Love and Hot Chocolate by Kay Banning Kellum. <laughs> I don't know, some of it felt spooky for the sake of, you know, which is fine, but I tend to prefer when they reveal what something means or implies me like, oh, oh no, I know, right? You need that little bit of like explanation sometimes to be like, no, 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 this is what's happening. You're like, oh shit. Baroska. <laughs> You're gonna promote that till, till the sun comes up, you know? I love it. I need to check these out, man. I've been stuck in the Grey's Anatomy binge watch cycle, you know? Stuff like gore and stuff doesn't bother me. I can eat my dinner while watching, you know, people do open heart surgery and other traumatic things. He's lost a foot, I see. Well, don't let me, uh, you know, stop you. I'm going to enjoy my food. Ah, uh, But this one is for Love and Hot Chocolate by Kay Banning Kellum. Oh, I love their names. They have such nice names. <laughs> Tragic encounters with moving cars. It was a dark evening when Blaine Kellerman lost control of his car with his wife in the passenger seat. They had been invited out to a friend's house in the suburbs and thus ventured into the darker woods, wooded areas that surrounded the city of New Orleans. Both Blaine and his wife Christine were lifelong residents of the section of New Orleans known as Mid-City. And although both of them were in their early 30s, they had little experience driving in the darker, more rural areas that made up the suburban section called the North Shore. It was a Friday night, neither Blaine nor his wife really desired to drive 45 minutes out of the city just to sit down and hang out with friends that they'd known most of their lives. However, the invitation had been sent, and since it was a Friday, no work the next day. The Kellermans agreed to make the short, long drive out to Covington, Louisiana, with their old friends Jessica and Tim had moved. Blaine had groaned more than his wife. He worked long hours in a cramped office building downtown. Christine worked farther out from the hub that was the new Orleans Central Business District, so she couldn't exactly share his pain. She worked at a small store with lots of parking and plenty of street space. Blaine worked on Poydras Street in the Harrah's Casino Legal Department. Poydras runs directly through the heart of the CBD and therefore he had to fight traffic coming and going to work, as well as park in an overpriced garage. It was worth it though. Blaine and Christine had been married for eight years now, all of them amazing. Sure, there were fights here and there, but at the end of each day, Blaine was always pleased beyond words at where his life had landed him. Good job, great marriage, there was nothing that Blaine could complain about until that Friday night. The dinner with friends had been fun. There was a mediocre home-cooked meal, which of course both Blaine and Christine raved about to their hosts. 
There were drinks served, but both Kellermans refrained from overindulging. A couple of board games were toted out after the eating and drinking were complete. Christine and Jessica clucked on about old times, old friends and old places. The men went outside on Tim's back porch to smoke cigars and also tell stories about old times and old crimes. Midnight rolled around quickly and general laughter was replaced by yawns and stretches. It was time to leave. Jessica insisted that they spend the night. Christine was game for it. The couch looked much more comfortable than spending nearly an hour in the car. Blaine, though, wanted to get home. This very want has become a constant source of guilt for the man, but we'll get to that soon enough. Blaine was a stubborn homebody, something that Christine found joy in teasing them about from time to time. He liked to go to sleep and wake up in his own bed. He was never a fan of spending the night with friends. Hotels he was fine with, since it was his own space. But staying with friends, or even family, was something that Blaine Kellerman simply disliked. I don't like feeling like a guest, Blaine insisted to his wife on Tim's porch. Honey, we're both tired. Let's just sleep here tonight and head home in the morning, she replied. We have plans tomorrow, babe, and you already know what's going to happen if we spend the night. Tim and Jessica are going to want to do stuff. Before you know it, our entire Saturday will be spent in Covington. Christine smiled and caved in. Okay, but you're driving, and no getting mad if I fall asleep on the ride back, Christine conceded. So goodbyes were said, hands were shaken, and hugs were issued out. By the end of the whole affair, even Christine was about ready to get back to the comfort and privacy of her own home. She loved her friends, but Blaine was right about privacy and such. She valued it She valued it as much as he did. The accident happened about 10 minutes after leaving Tim and Jessica's home. The fatigue really set into Blaine while he and Tim smoked cigars. He didn't want to admit it though. After all, he'd been up since 6am and had put in a 9 hour workday at the office. However, he knew if he gave in, he'd be spending the night and he didn't want to sleep on Tim's sofa. By the time he and Christine were pulling out into the street, he was running on mental fumes. Christine looked over and offered to drive. Blaine brushed it off. Perhaps had he let her drive. His next decision point came when they pulled into one of the few 24-hour gas stations in Covington. He went in and bought a Red Bull, even though, based on his daily caffeine intake, he knew the energy drink was more for the flavour than the energy. The main drag that runs through Covington is called HWYUS190. Covington at 1am usually had almost no traffic. Blaine knew this, so he was paying more attention to digging his can of Red Bull out of the plastic grocery bag than he was to the road. Still, on any other night, this wouldn't have made a difference. The car that hit him was driven not by teenagers breaking curfew, nor a drunk driver. Nothing so easy to blame. It was just another driver, out late in a small town. He probably thought the same thing that Blaine did. That there would be no one else on the road. The traffic light was out. There was not even the flashing yellow light that sometimes came on. There simply was no light at all. Because of the lack of development in that area, there were no street lights to warn Blaine that a side street was approaching. Something as simple as a stop sign may have changed everything. There was no stop sign though, and thus fate enforced its will. The other driver, a man named Martin Bendels, struck Blaine's car on the passenger side, directing all of the force of metal and momentum onto Christine. Blaine's head struck the steering wheel, with the airbag deploying and possibly saving his life. 
Christine was not so lucky. Her airbag did not deploy. Her head struck the dashboard, then snapped backwards, jerking her back into the seat. Her neck and head took almost all of the force. The coma of Christine Kellerman. By the way, this is the story that I believe Mr. Pinkerton came from. <laughs> Blaine woke up in the hospital many hours later. Doctors came in and explained what happened. Where is my wife? Where is Christine? Blaine demanded to know. All would be revealed and the terror was still unfolding. Christine was knocked into a coma. The doctors did all they could but her brain showed no signs of life. Machines were doing her eating and breathing. Several months passed, Blaine slowly recovered. Physical therapy did its job, and by the time six months passed, he was pretty much physically whole again. Martin Bendels, the hapless driver who struck Blaine's car, died in the hospital. Blaine considered his passing to be no great loss. Christine, however, did not wake up. She slept on in her coma. Blaine went to her bed each and every day. He brought in her favourite foods and drinks. They had picnics in the hospital room. Some days he would wake up and just know, know without a doubt, that his wife was going to wake up that day. He would race to the hospital, even bringing her a new change of clothes as though she was just going to jump out of that hospital bed ready to change out with her gown and head home. That was Blaine's illusion of the situation. Anyway, and perhaps the only thing that kept him sane. He had sued the car company for the defective airbag. There was a huge settlement out of court with the Automot Automotive Corporation agreeing to pay for any and all of Christina's medical bills. Blaine ordered the doctors to keep her alive on the machines because he was convinced that one day she might just wake up. With the settlement money, Blaine was able to take a substantial amount of time from work. His boss would call him from time to time to ask when he planned on returning. Blaine would usually brush this off. In his heart, he knew he couldn't go back to work until Christine returned to him. Perhaps he could have lived like this for years too. He would spend each and every day with her, talking to her in her coma, massaging her muscles, watching television next to her lifeless shell. He would tell her about his day, and with each passing week, with each advancing month, he would become more and more sure that any time now, she would just wake up. The doctors explained to him the full extent of her injuries. They told him that the odds of her waking up were almost nil. Blaine would hear none of it. Even Christine's family eventually let their voices be heard. They wanted the machines turned off. It's wrong for her to live like that, Maggie, Christine's sister screamed at Blaine over the phone. It's wrong to kill my wife too, to just turn off the machines and watch her choke to death or starve to death or however the process works, he shouted back. We have legal recourse, Blaine, and if you won't end her suffering, we will bring the law into it, demanded Christine's mother. You'll have to kill me before I let that happen. How can you sit there and lobby for them to kill your daughter? She is alive. She is still there. Would you allow her to die if she might wake up the next day? screamed Blaine. Blaine, you know how much we love Christine, and you too. But son, have you been listening to the doctors? She isn't going to wake up. Her brain, her brain is dead. What's laying in that hospital bed that isn't our daughter, that isn't your wife? Please, let's do this with dignity. Don't force us to bring in the law on a family matter. That particular logic bomb was being delivered by Fred, Christine's father. He was a level-headed family man and he was a fool if he thought for even a second that Blaine was going to allow them to just kill his wife. He would fight them to the end. This argument raged on for weeks. Blaine was perfectly willing to continue this verbal joust, but things moved a lot faster than he was prepared for. 
legal papers were filed and for the first time when Blaine actually found himself standing in court, explaining to the judge why Christine should be allowed to live, he realised that he could lose her. Christine's family made valid points in court. They had medical papers, testimony from doctors and other medical professionals, all outlining exactly how pointless it was to keep her alive on the machines. Blaine began to feel small and weak in the debate. They had facts and statistics. He was just a sad and broken man begging a stranger in a black robe to allow him more time with his wife. For the first time since the accident, he began to feel truly helpless in the situation. They were going to take her away from him with the power of the law to do it. He would have no means by which to stop them. Legal wheels do turn slowly though. Everyone knows that. Almost a year went by. Court was held, opinions were voiced. Pro-life groups rallied for Blaine's cause. However, these were the same nuts that wanted to tell women what to do with their bodies. They were Bible thumpers at best. A faction of society that Blaine would ne have never associated with before this. Now, they were his only hope. Toward the end, the final days in court, Blaine already knew which way the judge was going to sway. He knew enough about court procedures to know he was going to lose. He couldn't watch her die, he couldn't be part of it. I love you so much, Christine. You are my life, my everything. They want to kill you. There's nothing I can do to stop it. In a week, the judge is expected to rule, and even I know. They've made a better case. I'm so sorry, my love. I'm so sorry, Christine. Blaine wept long into that night. He finally went home around 11pm. Things went better then. He broke down into tears and simply, but simply wouldn't stop flowing. Everything in their home reminded him of their lives together. Photos on the wall, their wedding, their anniversaries, how happy they were together. Emmy, their pet cat, would jump into his lap. She was an old cat now, but he still remembered the day they went down to the animal shelter together and brought her home. I will love you forever and ever, he mumbled to himself. It was what he said to her the day they were married. But will you love me forever, forever and forever? She responded later that night when they were alone in their hotel room. Take all the stars in the sky, multiply them by forever and add in a few more forevers and you still wouldn't be close. They had laughed and made love forever and ever Blaine was starting to realise just how short that theoretical time frame could be. Talking to Astrid It was the thought of the stars that next inspired Blaine. During the course of his marriage to Christine, the stars had played a big part, at least in law, to their success. The night that Blaine decided he wanted to ask her on their first date, he had been standing in his front yard. It was twilight and the very first star had appeared that night. On a whim, he had invoked that old child's nursery rhyme about wishing on the stars. Starlight, star bright, first star I see tonight. I wish I may, I wish I might. Have the wish, I wish tonight. He had recited this little astral ritual, followed by wishing Christine would agree to go on a date with him. That night he called her and she said yes. Blaine had made the same wish again on the night he intended to propose, and on the same night his wish was once again granted. Now, Blaine was a smart man and didn't believe in much superstition, but still, the double success of this little tradition did strike him almost as fate at work. Years later, he told Christine about his little twilight wishes. She laughed about it, but they kept the tradition going. Before they bought their first house, they did a star wish. They got their home at an unbelievably low interest rate. Almost, some would say, a miracle. 
Christine, who was the art major of the marriage, began following this tradition talking to Astrid. When the couple needed a real long shot of luck, they would wait until dusk, sometimes even checking online to see what time the very first stars would start to appear that night, and they would go out into their front yard and sit on the grass and wait. When the first star became visible, they would make their wish, and as luck would have it, each and every time they talked to Astrid, their desire would be met. We should wish for a million dollars, Blaine had mentioned one night. It won't come true that way, Christine corrected. So far, our wishes have been for unselfish desires, things that we need, rather than millions of dollars. Plus, I feel like if we made a wish like that, it wouldn't come true, and that might break our streak of luck with Astrid. Christine made a great point, and she and Blaine had never abused their crazy stargazing methods. In Blaine's mind, he always just assumed these things would have happened either way, and the star wishing was really just more of a morale booster than an effectual process. He was pretty sure that Christine believed the same. Still though, it was something that was fun and something that was theirs. Tonight, as Blaine placed his small home, placed his small home, a home that felt somehow even smaller without his wife there to share the space, he decided to try once more. In his heart, he knew it was just a stupid child's fantasy that something would actually come from wishing on a star. However, he had tried all of the adult methods of saving his wife. From medical to legal and now it seemed as though nothing would work. Blaine stepped out onto his front yard at dusk. Being in the middle of the city always meant that there weren't a ton of stars to be seen, especially early in the evening. One usually had to wait until later, once all traces of the sun were gone, to really see the diamonds light up the sky. He sat on his porch, smoked a cigarette, a habit that started just recently, and waited until the sky was mostly darkened. The sky at twilight in the city always had a neon glow, something that used to bring him comfort. Tonight the lights from the street lamps and the nearby downtown high-rises just seemed to weigh down on his mind. He scanned the sky for the first star, and quickly found Venus in her usual spot near the moon. Venus was a planet though, and tonight he wanted to talk to Astrid, not just some non-twinkling rock in the sky. He looked over and saw Mars, apparent by its reddish glimmer. It never occurred to him that he was picking out a lot of heavenly bodies for this time of night in New Orleans. The sky seemed to be opening up for him as never before. Then, he saw it. A real star, apparent by its shimmer. He almost thought he was looking at Mars again, but there was an unmistakable red hue. He looked back and saw the non-glimmering Mars right where it should be. So what was he looking at? He was no astronomer, so seeing this tiny, slightly rust-coloured star shining in the evening sky didn't exactly throw him into overdrive. It was a star. A rather unique one, that. He decided that as far as wishing goes, this one was as good as any other. Starlight, star bright, first star I see tonight. I wish I may, I wish I might, have the wish I wish tonight. He recited as always. Tears were falling down his face now. Bring back Christine, please, star, god, whoever, please. I can't live without her. I am broken without her in my life. She's everything to me. I will do anything. Just please. Blaine stood there a moment longer, allowing himself to weep. Thankfully, none of his neighbours were out. He didn't care if, he, if they saw him cry, but he didn't feel like answering the always lovely, are you all right question. This was his and Christine's connection. He had talked to Astrid. He returned to his home, slamming the door behind him, wishing on stars. Yeah, I'm on top of the world. 
he mumbled to himself before collapsing on his couch. The next segment is called Mr. Pinkerton. And this is the story of where my Mr. Pinkerton voice came from, by the way. Hello, Ducky. Happy Halloween, baby. I hope you're doing well. This is one of the longer stories. All right. Give myself a moment to catch my breath. All right. <laughs> it's a metallic. It's oh, nice. I haven't listened to Metallica in ages. So, we're at Mr. Pinkerton now. Thank you for the hug, sweetie! That night, he was awoken by a knock at his door. It was a gentle and restrained knock, as though the person knew he would be right there on his couch, instead of upstairs in their bed, where he most certainly would have slept through it. Blaine rolled off the couch and looked at the clock on his cable box, 11.04. Who the hell would be knocking this late? The knock returned in the same restrained manner. However, there was a strange persistence in it. Something that said the person wasn't going anywhere. They could wait. Blaine grabbed the baseball bat that he kept for just this sort of thing and peered through the peephole. On the other side was a small man probably about five foot six at the most. Blaine could only make out part of his face and he was wearing one of those old flat brimmed hats. The kind that old southern politicians were always seen wearing back in the 1950s. The round brim cast a shadow over his eyes and nose. The hat was blue and white striped. Who is it? Blaine replied in a gruff voice. Mr. Kellerman. Oh, Mr. Kellerman. My name is Mr. Pinkerton, but my friends all call me Mr. Pinky. I would just love it if you called me that too. I'm here to speak with you on a very personal business matter. I do believe you reached out to me and my associates this very evening. Whoever this Pinkerton man was, he was almost a walking cliché. He had a southern accent that was practically a caricature, caricature, caricature of the southern dandy. He pronounced Blaine's last name, Keller Man, and really threw out a lot of his words to emphasis. What business do we have, Mr Pinkerton? Blaine inquired through the locked door. He still sounded gruff, but Pinkerton seemed to pay no mind. Mr. Kellerman, if you could be ever so gracious as to open your door, we could discuss the matter at much greater detail, and in far more human comfort, I would imagine. You show up at my door at this hour <coughs> and expect me to invite you in for coffee. Whatever you're selling, I'm not buying. Piss off, Pinky. Blaine observed a small smile whisk across Pinkerton's face. However, he did not move from his position on the porch. Mr. Kellerman. No two things. If you turn me away now, I will never return. You will never see me or hear from me again. But also know this, your precious Christine will die. 
Suddenly, heat rushed through Blaine's face. A rage so sudden and so raw that he almost felt faint. He flung the door open. The sight of Mr. Pinkerton just about deflated his anger. The man was indeed short. He had a pot belly and he was wearing a blue and white suit that matched his ridiculous hat. He had a bow tie around his neck, tied loose. His skin did have a pinkish hue, as though to match his name. Blaine realised it was no doubt sunburn. Pinkerton looked like a very delicate man, a true dandy if ever there was one. Blaine wouldn't have been surprised if the moonlight on this very night had given Pinkerton his burn. His eyes, however, told a different story. His eyes looked sharp and cunning, a dark blue piercing stare. His eyes made him look a little dangerous in the dim glow of his porch light. What did you say about Christine? Blaine demanded. Well now, Mr. Kellerman, does this mean I might enter your humble domicile? If this is a con, I will fuck your world up, snarled Blaine Kellerman. Sir, if this is a con, I will gladly offer you my body to enact your every primal desire of revenge. However, once you hear what I have come to say, I do believe harming me will be your last impulse. Blaine backed up and allowed Pinkerton to enter his home. He removed his hat, revealing a perfectly bald head. May I sit? he asked. Blaine gestured to his couch. Pinkerton sat and placed his hat neatly in his lap. I would so love that coffee you mentioned before, Mr. Kellerman if you would be ever so kind. And if I may venture to be so bold as to make a suggestion to the man of the house, I would implore you to make yourself a cup as well. You're gonna want to be awake for this. Blaine was in sort of a waking shock at this little man. He would invited himself in, ordered himself a cup of coffee, and even suggested one for Blaine. Pinkerton had a certain energy about him that Blaine was hard pressed to identify. Blaine returned a few minutes later with two steaming cups of coffee. Pinkerton requested his black, same as Blaine. Okay, Pinky, you got in, you got your coffee. Now tell your story. What do you know about Christine? How can you possibly help me? The small man sipped his brew and smiled. He licked his lips and began speaking. Blaine was entranced from start to finish. Hello, Eamon, darling. Welcome to the origin stories, Mr. Pinkerton, by the way. <laughs> Mr. Kellerman, tonight, at about 7.45 p.m., as you know time, you ventured right out there into your front yard and called out to the very stars for help, did you not? Blaine nodded. Over the years, this was a bit of a tradition of you and your wife. Let me tell you, there was no magic in those wishes. You simply had good luck. However, your belief, your honouring of such old and glorious traditions certainly did catch the attention of my superior. It is indeed a thrill to see a young man such as you in this here modern world still holding true to ways and days that have long passed by. What do you mean? Blaine asked. Picture this, Mr. Kellerman. And really, I do mean P. 
picture what I say in your mind. Eons and eons ago, there was a kingdom among the stars, a floating castle, as you would no doubt imagine it. In that castle sat a very powerful king. His name? Well, he has many. King Tobit is the best for your tongue, I do believe. A few of his other names are a bit, let's say, twisty. Anyway, Tobit sat in his castle in the stars, granting his favor to those who called out to him. For centuries, he would bestow his kindness onto mortal creatures, small critters like yourself scampering through your ever so short time on this level of existence. For some time, this pleased Tobit to no end. People would speak his name, glorify his image, he of the goat's head and man's body. Then, things changed. People demanded his favor, blamed him for their problems. And unlike other powerful beings that your kind know, Tobit did not forgive so easily. He shifted his favor to those who deserved it, those who were willing to earn it, those that would risk it all. He even came to Earth and built a city just for his most loyal Oh, and what a paradise it is. But the cost to reside there, well, that doesn't concern you. I'm not here to invite you to his glorious city in the frozen lands. That's a different ritual altogether. What I am here to offer you, Mr. Kellerman, is your wish. That very desire that you cried out for tonight in your yard. When you gazed upon King Tobit's star, that star revealed itself to you, Mr. Kellerman. Because King Tobit believes in you. Oh, yes, he does. He believes that you may be worthy of his favor. However, sir, you will have to prove it. Blaine spoke up for the first time in what seemed forever. You mean, you're telling me, Pinky, that this Tobit character can bring Christine back from her coma? Pinkerton smiled and snapped his fingers, as if for emphasis. Just like that, Mr. Kellerman, at King Tobit's whim, your lovely bride will simply <coughs> awaken, as though she has just been in a long slumber. There will be no brain damage, no physical problems. As far as she will know, it will be as if she simply fell asleep after one too many mint juleps. And won't that just amaze her family, who seem to be in such a rush to see her demise? This has to be a trick. You, you can't be serious, Blaine insisted. Answer me this, Mr. Kellerman. Are you prepared to gamble on that? Let's say I am just some crazy man, some individual that has been following you and your problems, just some lunatic out for a good time. You could thrash my tender hide at this very moment, or... You could call your local police to come on over here and haul me away, but you haven't. No, you sat here and listened to me talk about god kings in floating castles, magical wishes, and bringing your wife back. Tell me, do you doubt me or just doubt yourself? Prove it then. If you really are magical, prove it. Blaine shouted. Now, now, Mr. Kellerman. Faith is of the utmost importance in such matters. If I went around doing parlor tricks for everyone who beckoned upon my master, well, 
this whole operation would turn into a traveling carnival. And me? I guess that would make me the clown, Mr. Kellerman. Like wishing on those stars, you must go into this with faith. The proof will be given to you in the form of your beautiful Christine waking up and calling out for her husband. What do I have to do then? Blaine asked cautiously. For now, simply sleep. You will need your strength come tomorrow. I will see you at my place of business where all rules will be explained and all contracts will be agreed upon. Should you succeed, you will have your wife back with you again. Happy and healthy. Wait now, if I succeed, <coughs> does that mean it isn't guaranteed? Mr. Kellerman, nothing in this sad, fragile world of ours is ever guaranteed, now is it? However, what I can promise you is that there are rules that will be followed. And at any and all participation will be fair and impartial. I am not here to see you succeed or fail. I'm simply here to make the offer and ensure that all aspects of the agreement are upheld at the conclusion of our arrangement. So if I succeed, Christine wakes up. What happens if I fail? Well now, Mr. Kellerman. At the risk of sounding cliché, if you fail, King Hyrak told Bid, get your soul for all of eternity. Okay, enough of this shit. Get out my house, you fucking nuts, Blaine said, raising his voice with each word. Very well, Mr. Kellerman. You did invite me in, and you did serve some very delicious coffee. So for you, I will make a small exception. Pinkerton pulled out a card from his suit pocket. Be at this address tomorrow. Come by yourself. I will wait for you until nightfall. And at that time, I will pack up my lovely little operation and move on to the next town. There are always people in need of favours. And I said at your door, You'll never see me again. And yes, your wife will most certainly die. If you want me to perform a miracle, allow me to predict the future for you real quick. Your wife's mother and father are going to win. The judge has already decided, in fact. They're going to allow the plugs to be pulled. And your sweet wife will fade out but not before suffering greatly. Pulling that plug doesn't bring instant death, but rather a very slow and deliberate suffering. And since her mind isn't capable of conceiving time in her current state, her suffering will seem like an eternity as she chokes and gasps, reaching for a rescue that will never come. Just get out of here, Blade screamed. Pinkerton showed himself to the door and stepped out to the porch. He turned and made one last comment before leaving. Be the hand that rescues Christine. She's searching for you even now, Mr. Kellerman. Should you meet her one day on the other side, do you want to tell her that you allowed her to die a horrible death? rather than spending one day with me to wake her back up. Come to the address tomorrow before sundown, or live in your misery forever. With that, Pinkerton quickly stepped down the porch to the sidewalk. Blaine, consumed with rage and emotion, grabbed his baseball pat, bat, intended to take out his ingression on the small, chubby man. He charged into the street to find Pinkerton, Gone. Blaine's Nightmare Blaine didn't sleep the rest of the night. He sat up and twirled the card in his fingers, 
looking down at the address. It was a spot way out in, in the country, in a small town called Madisonville, Louisiana. Oddly enough, Madisonville. Jesus! God damn it, Chozo! Oddly enough, Madisonville was not that far from Covington, where all of this began. <laughs> Blaine was almost sure that this Pinkerton asshole was just as full of shit as any one man could be. All of the information he presented Blaine was readily available if someone really wanted to dig a little. The newspaper ran an article on the accident last year. The hospital records were sealed, of course, but Blaine knew all too well that Christine's sister kept a pretty updated blog. He'd read it himself a few times. It detailed all the secrets of their lives, comic and tragic alike. Blaine was thinking out loud. So let's say that Pinkerton is a con artist and all of this is just a scam. What does he have to gain? Blaine was directing this set of questions at Emmy the cat. Emmy gazed at him with her sleepy eyes as if to say, humans. So many stupid questions. Maybe he wants to get me out there in the middle of nowhere and kill me. You th did you think about that? Emmy stared back silently. Blaine answered his own question. Well, if he wanted to kill me, he could have just done it right here. Why would he leave me the address on a car? Knowing that I could just call the cops, or have someone wait around for me to make sure I was all right. The cat looked back. She seemed to be bored with the situation. Blaine waged this internal debate until almost sunrise, when fatigue finally caught up to him. At that point, he fell asleep and dreamed. He was at home, but it was different. The house was lit up bright with life. Emmy was purring, music was playing from the television, and the smell of hot chocolate filled the room. Of course it did, though. Christine loved hot chocolate. She didn't drink coffee, no. She drank hot chocolate almost all the time, even in the summer. Blaine walked into the kitchen and saw the cup of hot chocolate, but no sign of Christine. Darling, will you bring me my drink? said Christine's voice. Of course she was upstairs in bed, it was early. She must have come down, made the cup, and then gone back up to snooze until he came home. Blaine grabbed the cup of warm liquid and began to take it upstairs. Here, baby, it's nice and hot. The sight before him stole his words. Christine was in their bed. She wasn't the Christine he knew. She was wasted, dying. Her face was too thin. Her arms were nothing more than sticks. There were machines hooked up to every part of her body. A large black pump was jutting out of her chest. It sucked in air and Blaine could hear the thump. Her heart. Before, the pump would deflate again. Each time it did, blood would splash out onto the bed. A device that looked like a car radiator was dug into her stomach, belching out black smoke. Tubes ran from her eyes, ears, nose, everywhere. Blaine, it hurts so bad. Please, I can feel this, all of it. Christine, what have they done to you? cried Blaine. This is what I feel, every second on the machines. Oh God, Blaine, please make it stop. Suddenly, Christine's family rushed in, her mother and father, their faces set and stern, like an executioner before he throws the switch off on an electric chair, or a hangman before he drops the platform. They began to rip the devices from Christine's body, and as they did, the life in her eyes slowly vanished. Her family backed away and began to weep softly. Christine was gagging, choking on air, her stomach began to sink in, becoming further emaciated. She looked at Blaine, mouthing pleas, begging him to stop the suffering. This will go on for weeks, Mr. Kellerman. A voice. Pinkerton standing directly behind Blaine. I have to stop this. She's suffering. Please. 
Blaine begged. If you leave her on the machines, she suffers. Take her off the machine, she suffers. Salvation, Mr. Kellerman. Salvation is yours to claim. There is no freedom from King Tobit. There is only freedom through King Tobit. Vie for his favour. Show your worth if you truly love her. If you are capable of expressing that love, well, just imagine. Pinkerton snapped his fingers and Christine was standing in the room, healthy, whole. Blaine, I feel so amazing, so much better. Thank you for bringing me my hot chocolate. You always know how to help wake me up. The room vanished again and Blaine was standing in the dark. Pinkerton was near him, whispering in his ear. Bring your wife her hot chocolate, Mr. Kellerman. Help her wake up. The room suddenly lit up and Blaine saw an image before him. A being standing at least 40 feet tall. A massive masculine frame with the head of a goat. Behind this being burned a red star. Its light and heat bore down on Blaine. Hyrak Tobit. All right, next bit is the Grove in Madisonville. Blaine snapped awake. It was late morning, at least according to the amount of light coming in through the window. The card was still in his hand. Without any thought, Blaine cleaned up, got dressed, and started driving. The trip to Madisonville was normally a long and boring ride. Blaine left the city by way of Lake Pontchartrain over the Causeway Bridge. He touched down in Mand Mandeville, a small town on the edge of a lake. Up ahead was a small green interstate sign announcing the exit for Madisonville. A few miles in, he found the turn off for Bannister Road. It was just a mud strip leading down into some thick woods. The mud right now was as hard as iron, but Blaine had an idea that when the rainy season came through, Bannister Road would be converted into a clay pit that not even a Range Rover could muscle through. Now the real question came, he was on Bannister Road, but as far as he could tell, there was nothing at all here. He drove down for a mile until it dead-ended into a thick grove of trees. Blaine couldn't help but think this scene would be beautiful, if not for the circumstances that brought him here. He stopped his car at the dead end and climbed out. He lit a cigarette and leaned against his trunk. He gazed around in all directions, and at first, it seemed that he didn't he was simply sitting in a deserted grove. Then he saw it. About 20 feet into the woods on the right, barely visible through the leaves and bushes, he could make out a roof. There was a building back there. It was bright red, which is what caught his attention. He peered harder through the trees and could gradually make out more features. It looked almost like a small circus tent. Perhaps a leftover remnant from a long past carnival. Then something Pinkerton said to Blaine occurred to him. He had made a comment about the carnival and being the clown, something like that. Was that a hint? Was this the place? Blaine rushed through the woods and came out into the clearing. The tent was old and ragged. Its, one br its once bright red and yellow designs was long gone. What stood before him was a destroyed artefact, a reminder that once there was fun and laughter, now this place was simply dead. Then Blaine noticed a single pink balloon tied to a nearby tree. The balloon was still inflated. It was put here recently. Blaine knew he had the right place. Drawing on his courage, which was small, and his love for Christine, which was large and noble, he gathered his nerves and stepped into the tent. We're on to the trials. 
I know there's a lot more to the Tobit series. I want to think that at least he was fair enough to, to let this be a fair deal. <laughs> Do you not know who Mr. Pinkerton is? Mr. Kellerman! shouted Pinkerton, full of glee, as Blaine entered the tent. The inside of the tent had a wrong feel to it that Blaine would be hard-pressed to describe. It was totally hollow inside. If this place ever did house happy, cheering people, those days were long gone. Now there was only Pinkerton, standing in the centre, wearing his blue and white striped suit. He was vigorously wiping at his forehead with his handkerchief. By the saints above, today is a hot one, is it not, Mr. Kellerman? I do say such climate is not suitable for a fine gentleman like ourselves. I came, Pinkerton. Now tell me how to get my wife back, Blaine commanded. A man who gets right to the point. You are a dying breed, Mr. Kellerman. Indeed you are. Why, if more gentlemen thought like you, perhaps your breed would have landed on the moon a thousand years ago, as was the plan. Oh, the threats that King Tobit hid for you there. The treats that King Tobit hid for you there. Such a shame you all missed that. No more games, no more riddles. You told me that you could save Christine. That is why I'm here, please. Well, your manners are commendable. Yes, you are here to save your wife, and I am capable of facilitating that very desire. However, before we begin, I must cover the rules. Do be a good ambassador to our beloved Dixie, and sit quietly as I explain. Blaine obliged and sat on the ground. His exterior almost appeared patient, but inside, inside he was burning. Now, as I said before, King Tobit has become, well, disenfranchised with mortals and their constant wants. Still, though, in all of his glory, he desires to shed his favour upon you. However, now it comes down to a test, a wager, really. You will complete a few tests of will, let's say. Like Hercules, you must demonstrate that your strength, your will, is both pure and stoic. Once you demonstrate these qualities to King Tobit, he shall bestow upon you your heart's desire. What are these tests? Blaine asked. Well, Mr. Kellerman, they vary. Once the trials begin, you will be at the whims of King Tobit himself. I will be here to sort of nod you in the right direction. <laughs> Bless you. But in the end, this is your test. Your rules and your duty to complete them. Now, as I stated back at your home, the name of the game here is Fairness. Our mighty lord is nothing if not utterly lawful. Even when he imposes his will on his servants, things that you might consider ghastly, it is never out of trickery. Everyone is given a fair chance. Especially in the court of wish fulfillment. The rules, as they are, are very simple. No cheating. Follow the instructions as they are presented. In order to, com to claim any prize, your wish, in other words, there must be a wager. Remember, Mr. Kellerman, your word will be a direct reflection on how King Tobit perceives your actions. Whatever you say, you must be prepared to follow through. 
Be very careful when choosing your words. Pinkerton stopped speaking long enough to gesture in the direction of another tent flap when a ragged, rough-looking man stepped through. This is Mr. Pede. He is under my employ and is here to provide a balance to your actions during the trials. PC looked like a mix between a pirate and a biker. He was dirty with a scruffy beard, a black bandana on his head, and a denim vest. He was wearing ragged pants that tore off towards the shins. He stood sort of hunched over, which really hammered home the pirate look. His arms were no joke though. Petey looked like he lived at the gym. Even though the idea of a man like this working out among preppy gym members seemed almost laughable. Is this the bastard pansy that couldn't take care of his wife? Petey grunted. His accent sounded like someone trying to do a London accent for a cheap stage play. Blaine tensed and prepared to reply, but Pinkerton beat him to it. Mr. Petey, we will have none of that. Your poor breeding and subpar upbringing is no excuse to speak to Mr. Kellerman in such a manner. He is our guest, and I have personally sought him out. You will behave in my presence. Sorry there, boss. You know, I, I got a stupid head sometimes. Just goes off on its own. Won't happen again, I say. Seeing this hulk of a man backing down to someone like Pinkerton actually unnerved Blaine more than it comforted him. It produced more questions like, who was Pinkerton really and how did he keep such a brute in line? Now, Mr. Kellerman, Petey will be in and out of some of your trials. He is simply here to ensure that everything is legal. King Tobit wants you to succeed, but he wants you to earn it. Petey spit on the ground in Blaine's direction and crossed his arms. He was clearly ready to do whatever his task was in all of this. Blaine didn't like it. So what do I have to do? Blaine asked. Ah, yes. We should begin soon. Even as we speak, your wife's family is making legal moves to try and lock you out of the decision-making. So, do you understand the rules, Mr. Kellerman? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Very well. What are you willing to do to save your wife? Anything. Petey smiled at that. Mr. Kellerman, I fear you weren't paying attention. I warned you about the rules. Had you just answered that question with something like, let's say eating ice cream cone, then that perhaps would have been your only test. But, like so many before you, you said anything. King Tobit holds us to our words, after all. You mean the trial has already begun? Mr. Kellerman, the trials began when I visited your home. <coughs> Jesus! I nearly died. Fucking Jesus. God damn it, babe! Oh! Where the fuck was I? Oh my god. Mr. Kellerman, the trials began when I visited your home. Now you're playing for keeps. Your contract was struck when you answered my question. Your soul is now on the bedding table. Ante up, Mr. Kellerman. Blaine felt a panic seeping in. Yet somehow, this still felt made up. This Pinkerton freak talked a good game. But so far, all he's really shown is his ability to hide out in a tent with some freak named Petey. Blaine felt his confidence harden a bit. Okay, fine. 
What's the next trial? Mr. Kellerman, I sense that you are still not playing your best game here. Now, King Tobit would not be happy if you were simply... What's the term, Petey? half in it, sir. Yes, that. You are wagering your very soul here. So in the spirit of fairness, allow me to relieve you of all doubt, since it is far too late for you to back out now anyway. Pinkerton produced, from what appeared to be thin air, a curtain hanging up on a rod. He released the rod and the whole apparatus simply hovered in the air. Neat trick, is it not? Now observe. Pinkerton slid the curtain to the side, revealing a tiny altar behind it. On the altar was a small stone statue, a goat-headed man. Blaine recognised it from his nightmare the previous night. It was Hyrak Tobit. Now, Mr. Kellerman, Allow me to show you where your soul will be delivered, should you fail to gain King Tobit's favour. Pinkerton waved his arms and suddenly the walls of the tent collapsed. Blaine gazed around in utter horror. As far as his mind could comprehend, he was in the pits of hell. Fire burned everywhere, even the sky itself seemed to blaze with flame. People lay here and there, wallowing in the ground, moaning, crying out. Blaine strained his eyes upon the horizon, the orange flame from the pitch black sky, all he could see. Convinced yet, Mr. Kellerman? The voice of Pinkerton filled the sky. Blaine strained to look directly above, and the entire sky was the face of Pinkerton. Only now he looked less like a portly southern dandy and a lot more like a demon from the darkest corners of the abyss. You're not in hell, Mr. Kellerman. No, that is a different playground for a different religion. You are on the Red Star, the wastelands where those that fail Hyrak Tobit find themselves for all of eternity. However, it does relate to your backward concepts of damnation in the fact that this is eternal. There is no hope. There is no escape. Blaine dropped to his knees. Please get me out of here. God help me. He screamed into the darkness and fire all around him. King Tobit is your god now, and I would suggest you avoid such blasphemy in the future. Now, have you seen enough, Mr. Kellerman? Or do you need further proof that this is not a car? Please, I believe you. For the love of... For the love of... Blaine caught himself before he said God. Very well, Mr. Kellerman. In a flash of light, Blaine was back in the tent. Pinkerton and PT were in their original positions. What the fuck was that? Blaine gasped. That'll be your ho that'll be your home if you fuck this up, grunted Petey. Yes, Mr. Kellerman. Mr. Petey's words are far from gentle and are barely grammatical, but he is correct. Should you fail to appease King Tobit, you can expect to spend all of eternity there on the Red Star. And imagine this. You were just there to witness it. You didn't feel the pain, the fire, or the thirst. You didn't feel the loneliness and desperation for freedom. Please keep all of that in mind as you complete your trials. For if you lose, you will be shown no mercy. The contest began. Mr. Kellerman, we will begin this easily enough. Tell me, where did you and Christine spend your first date? Blaine gathered his wits and quickly, as quickly as he could. He was now terrified, but he was determined to get his love for his wife guide his mind. Okay, okay, that's easy. I'll gear's point. 
I took her across the river and we sat on the bank of the Mississippi and had a picnic. Sorry, Mr. Kellerman, that is wrong, replied Pinkerton with a frown. No, I know where I took Christine on our first date. I planned the whole thing out myself, Blaine demanded. You're playing this selfish, sir. Your first date in her eyes was a simple hamburger at a little shack called Bud's Proyer. As I recall, you took her there after work one day. We were Franks then, that wasn't to date. To her it was. How could such a doting husband have missed the look in her eyes at that simple little meal? She was already falling for you. Sad, really. And that was the easy form of test. Blade once again tried to center himself. Clearly this game was rigged, at least to an extent. Trick, trick question right from the start. He would have to do better if he was going to save Christine and himself. Let's try again, shall we? Invited Pinkerton. Blaine nodded. He'd be ready this time. Pinkerton waved his arms. Of three items appeared before Blaine. A silver locket, a wedding <coughs> ring, a small personal mirror. Mr. Kellerman, which of these items is the most relevant to Christine as a symbol of love? Choose wisely. Blaine did think long and hard on this. The locket, that was an anniversary gift. He'd spent a fortune on it, and Christine had scolded him, lovingly, for using most of his annual bonus on a gift. The mirror, he remembered it also. He and Christine had gone camping in Alabama one year, and he bought her that mirror for the trip. He made some joke about how she'd still spend an hour on her makeup, even at a campsite. She'd laughed about it, but did in fact end up using it for most of the trip. And the wedding ring, the symbol of their love, he had placed it on her delicate finger the day he swore to love her forever and ever. He knew it was the ring. His confidence was solid. Her wedding ring, of course. The symbol of my eternal love for her. Pinkerton frowned again. Oh, Mr. Kellerman, what a shame. The correct answer was the mirror. Had you taken the time to pick it up, you would have seen your own reflection. You are indeed a stronger symbol of love to her than any jewelry could ever be. Or do you think of her in such a shallow light? Blaine felt the air leave his body. He was down two strikes already and on such easy questions. Let us move on, Mr. Kellerman, for the longer we linger on our failures, the more difficult it will be to return to the track of success. Pinkerton waved his arms again, and a mug of dark liquid appeared before him. Hot chocolate, Christine's favourite. Am I correct, sir? asked Pinkerton. Yes, she loves it. I would bring her a mug almost every morning, responded Blaine. Of course, sir, and now you simply must bring the mug to me. Allow King Tobit to witness your affection. Simply grasp the mug and bring it to me. Blade nodded. At least this one wasn't a trick question or anything. Simple task. Blade grasped the mug and began to walk it toward Pinkerton. That's it, Mr. Kellerman. That's it. Right to me. Blaine actually allowed himself to relax a bit and immediately paid for it. A sharp pain suddenly inflicted itself into Blaine's side, followed by another hard thud to the centre of, of his back. He fell to the ground, spilling the hot chocolate into the mud. What the fuck? Blaine had time to choke out before Petey delivered another hard kick to his ribs. The dis the diseased looking fucker was smiling through his yellow and rotting teeth. Mr. Kellerman, I warned you before all of this began that Petey was here to challenge you. I know for a fact that each morning 
you would ever so carefully bring Christine her drink. Step in wisely to ensure you didn't spill a drop. Do you mean to tell me that you were more concerned about tripping over your rug at home than you are about a thug like our Mr. Pete, Petey here? What a sad state you're in, sir. Another failure, and on such a simple task. You bastard, he sucker punched me. How the fuck is that fair? Blaine grunted, trying to catch his wind. It's fair, because I warned you about it well in advance. It is my, f it is my fault that you are such a simple man, that you had to apply all of your cognition on carrying a mug. Mr. Petey didn't vanish and appear behind you. He walked to your blind spot, right out in the open. You were the one who failed to see such an obvious ploy. Do not shift blame here, Mr. Kellerman, or I will happily declare this contest over. Is that what you want? Are you finished, sir? Two simple questions and a task that a blind child could perform. Is that all it takes to defeat your will? Is that all the love you can muster for your wife? No, I'm not done. I will never stop fighting for Christine, Blaine shouted. Then prove it, Pinkerton answered sharply. The world flashed again and Blaine was in a moving car, behind the wheel. He didn't know where he was, but the road was dark and tall pines lined the sides. Where am I? he shouted. Pinkerton's voice answered from nowhere and everywhere. You were in the car that was once owned by a pathetic little son named Martin Bendels. Remember him? The man whose car struck yours? The man who caused your wife to fall into a coma? You are in Mr. Bendel's position now. Since I know that you feel it was all his fault, that he caused all of your problems, let us see if you can do any better. Blaine suddenly recognized the environment. This was Covington, that dark side road where Bendel's had emerged. Up ahead, Blaine could see the intersection. He didn't want to believe what he was witnessing. He slammed his foot on the brakes, but the car continued to move forward. He honked his horn and flashed his lights, trying his damn best to warn his past self of his approach. The intersection came into clear view. Ahead, he could see, he could see his Jeep Patriot, or at least his former Jeep Patriot, before the accident. He slammed his foot on the brake over and over again, honked the horn, but nothing changed. In that horrifying moment, he saw Christine's face, awake and aware for the first time in over a year. It was not the wonderful moment he had imagined, though. He saw the fear as she turned to look. He saw that fear turn into utter horror. He saw her mouth open to scream, her eyes widen, her arms flail up to shield her face. Than the impact. He saw her beautiful face smash into the dashboard as an airbag failed to deploy. He saw her head snap back against the seat from the impact. It all happened in slow motion for him. He was back in the tent again, on his knees, weeping. Mr. Kellerman, what happened? I gave you the chance to change it all. To prevent the accident. You wasted it. No, no. I tried to stop. I hit the brake. The fucking car kept going. Blaine was almost begging. Sir, you could have turned your car off of the road. Your steering wheel worked just fine. Sure, you would have been injured, maybe killed. But Christine would have been spared. How sad is it? that you were still selfish, even in the moment that could have changed it all. No, it was a trick. Bendel's brakes didn't fail. I remember that from the accident report. He just wasn't paying attention. You, you rigged it. Rigged it? Is that what you dare say, Mr. Kellerman? 
Nothing here is free. You said that you would do anything, anything to save Christine. Am I to believe that running a car into a tree falls outside the realm of anything? Blaine gasped, but no words could come out of his mouth. Mr. Petey, I am beginning to think that our dear friend Mr. Kellerman doesn't want to save his wife. Have we not played fair with him? Have we not presented the rules to him in the most transparent means possible? Well, boss, I knew the little runt was a failure when he walked in. Little softy is all he is, ain't he, boss? I bet that little wife of his went into that coma just to get away from him, replied Petey. You shut the fuck up, screamed Blaine, as he rushed Petey with all his rage. Petey sidestepped and delivered a hard knee into Blaine's abdomen, followed by a fist driven into the back of his head. Blaine collapsed. Now, now, sir. None of that. If you cannot even abide Mr. Petey's foul and uncultured sense of humour, how could you possibly hope to gain the favour of King Toby? scolded Pinkerton. Blaine gasped and finally found air in his lungs. On legs that felt far too weak, he brought himself to his feet. Mr. Kellerman, when I met with you at your home last night, I felt like you were a champion of your love. Why, I even remarked to Mr. Petey here that this would be a short trial. I simply knew you were going to succeed. It pains me to be so harshly corrected by you. Why, I do believe you have been wasting our time. Told you so, boss. Told you this guy was a chump. Petey chimed in, happily shedding misery on Blaine. Hello, hello, Hitoshi. <laughs> Thank you for the splash, bro. Oh, for fuck's sake. God damn it, Chozo! Oh! Damn it, where was I? Oh! One more test, Mr. Kellerman. I do implore you to try on this last one. It is of little secret at this point that you have utterly disappointed King Toby. However, in his infinite mercy and wisdom, he will grant you one final round trial. However, it will not be simple. Pinkerton waved his arms one more time and Blaine found himself in a hospital. Not any hospital though. Rather, the very hospital where his wife was silently wasting away in his sleep. Standing next to him was Petey. The voice of Pinkerton filled the halls. Gentlemen, this is a simple foot race. The finish line is Christine Kellerman. Now, Mr. Kellerman. It is your simple trial to reach your beloved wife before Mr. Petey. In your hand, you will notice a cup of her favorite hot chocolate. Bring it to her, help her wake up. After all, your wife's very words profess that she can simply never wake up without her drink. Should Petey reach your wife first, well, let's just say you don't want that to happen. He is a very nasty man, and I doubt a woman in a coma would deter his more, let us say, primal urges. Gentlemen, we shall begin when Mr. Kellerman declares that he is ready. Blaine gathered all of his concentration. He knew there was a trick here. Regardless of how fair Pinkerton swore this would be, every single trial had been rigged. He knew that. This one would be no different. He looked down at the cup of hot chocolate, and that was when inspiration hit. Okay, I'm ready, Blaine shouted. 
Without hesitation, Blaine turned and slung the hot chocolate into Petey's face, causing the large man to drop to his knees and grasp his face. Blaine didn't wait to enjoy his suffering though, he bolted down the hall toward the stairs. Mr. Kellerman, what about her hot chocolate? The voice of Pinkerton echoed. If you really knew me as well as you claim to, you would know that every day I visit her hospital room and every day I bring a packet of hot chocolate mix. There is plenty of it in her room. Blaine shouted, almost laughing as he ran. Finally, the noble husband is playing to win, the voice of Pinkerton answered. Blaine made a sharp turn into the stairwell, but could hear the heavy footfalls of Petey only inches behind him. He was halfway up the first flight of stairs when a hand grasped his ankle, pulling him down. Petey. Blaine wasted no time smashing the mug over Petey's head. The large man grunted in pain and Blaine delivered a swift kick to his face, causing him to tumble down the short flight of stairs. Why, you smashed the mug, Mr. Kellerman. However will she drink it? What, you think I bring hot chocolate packets without a mug? The favourite mug has been sitting in her hospital room for months now. Blaine announced, feeling for the first time hopeful. Well now, Mr. Kellerman, perhaps we have all underestimated you. Blaine made it to the fourth floor. Petey was hot on his trail, but he knew his wife's room, room 416. Through the door and to the right, directly past the nurse's station, Blaine was now running with all his might. Christine was so close now. All he had to do was round the corner and he'd be there. Then, disaster struck. A sharp pain far too intense to be anything other than a blade slashed into his hip. Petey wielding a knife. Blaine collapsed. Blood quickly caked his pants. He attempted to stand, but could put, but could put no weight on his leg. He was cut deep. I'll crawl to her, he grunted, but was quickly planted on the floor by Petey's boot. So sorry there, pal. You thought you were cute with your little hot chocolate in my face, but old Petey is in this to win. The burly man spoke directly into Blaine's face, his sour breath and body odour seeming to hammer in his taunts. Your wifey in there is going to make a great little prize now, isn't she? I miss you though. Old Petey is gonna take real good care of her. Till they pull the plug anyway. Enjoy the red star. With that, Petey walked into Christine's room and Blaine found himself back at the tent. Petey was standing next to Pinkerton, who no longer seemed charmed or cultured. Now he looked hungry. Well, Mr. Kellerman. I do believe that concludes our trials. You did your best, as pitiful as your best turned out to be. However, the contest was presented and delivered in a fair manner. With all rules enforced, you simply failed. Now prepare yourself. Blaine's words began to fade. He began to smell burning flesh, the heat of the burning star began to grow. The world phased between the tent and the red star. Reality shifted. Blaine had time to cast his final thoughts to Christine. How proud she was of him. How much they loved each other. Their first date, their wedding day. She even supported Blaine when he worked in dead-end jobs, such as when he was a legal copywriter for Harrah's Casino. The job paid barely enough to keep the lights on, they always had their love and what more light could anyone need and to think a man whose entire career was once built around proofing contracts and finding loopholes loopholes are legal loopholes are bending bending of the rules that's how blaine had risen in the corporate ranks got moved up to the executive wing of the casino's legal department legal department winning the loop loopholes one final appeal. 
Wait. Flame screen. Oh, what now, Mr. Kellerman? Are you going to tell us how you deserve another chance? Because of love or faith? Or some other pathetic mortal platitude? No. I'm going to tell you how I would. Flame stated in a very matter-of-fact voice. By all means, Mr. Kellerman, do tell. Pinkerton had cast aside the southern charm. He now had the spite and tone of, well, damn it all, he sounded like a lawyer. You told me at the beginning of all this that in order to claim the prize, a wager was required, correct? Of course, do hurry along with this, answered Pinkerton. You also insisted that successful and motivated attempts at each of the trials were necessary in claiming the prize, correct? Pinkton didn't answer, but simply twirled his finger in that go-on gesture. Finally, you stated that terms of this contest were of the most literal sense, correct? That what we say in this contest directly affects the rules and guidelines, correct? Yes, Mr. Kellum. I'm well aware of the rules of the very contest that I... Blaine stood, putting him off. Then Petey lost. Petey goes, not me. What? You little shit. You little cunt. How dare you try and... Petey was cut off this time. How did Petey lose in a contest for your heart's desire? Demanded Pinkerton. On the last test, when we were in the hospital, Petey told me that he would claim Christine. By your very own policy, one must play the game in order to claim the prize. And the wager in the game is always the person's soul. Lane announced. Mr. Kellerman, you're rambling now, trying to avoid. Blaine cut him off again. Petey didn't participate in half of the challenges, but even if all of that is void, even if only the last challenge mattered, Petey, Petey didn't bring my wife her hot chocolate. He failed. And since there is a wager on the board, there must be a declared winner. Since Petey failed at the contest, since he disqualified himself, that would make the runner-up the winner. That would be me. Nice try, Mr. Kellerman, but do you recall? You had hot chocolate in the room, along with her favourite mug. You said so yourself, shouted Pinkerton. But did he make the chocolate? Did he complete the task? Blaine demanded. Of course he did. He knows that such... Pinkerton was cut off. One more time. I'm not asking you, Pinky. I am asking him, Blaine bolstered, pointing directly at the small statue of Hyrak Tobit. King Tobit, you called for a test. You called for true will and strength. I delivered. Surely you do not care about watching a mortal remember a first date location or pick out an item or even race through a hospital with a mug of Swiss Miss. You wanted to know if I was worthy. Well, I wager it all now. I will wager my soul that Petey is lying. He never made her the drink. He failed. If I am wrong, I give you my soul willingly. And since your honest agent, Mr. Pinky over there, was so quick to vouch for Petey, I am quite sure that he will happily wager his soul that he is telling the truth. So how about it, King Tobit? Can a simple mortal stand on his convictions and truly be willing to give anything for your favour? Pinkerton fell silent. He knew that he had been bested. Should he bet against Blaine, he knew that he would lose, as he knew that Petey never made the chocolate. Goodbye, Pete, Mr. Petey. Enjoy eternity. Pinkerton mumbled, sounding very defeated. What? No! Now you little fuck, you can't do this to me. I've been loyal to you. You're letting that little piece of shit manipulate. There, those were Petey's final words as he vanished into the fire and suffering that was awaiting him on the Red Star. Well now, Mr. Kellerman, well done. Well done indeed. It took you until the very end, but you finally understood what it was to risk everything. You honoured your words. You were very willing to do anything, give anything, to have your wife again. Pinkerton sounded totally deflated. 
Perhaps he had hoped for Blaine to lose, or maybe he was very just attached to Petey. Who knew? So, it's over. Is Christine going to awaken? Blaine uttered. My word is my bond, Mr. Kellerman. You have gained Hyrak Tobit's favour. Your wish is granted. Enjoy the rest of your life. Pinkerton placed his hand over Blaine's face, and Blaine collapsed to the ground. The ringing of his cell phone brought Blaine back to reality. He was on his couch. He was having some sort of nightmare. Something about an evil little man playing games for souls. He reached over and picked up his phone. It was Maggie, no doubt calling to tell Blaine that she had won another legal battle to hasten Christine's death. He pushed the receive button on his phone. What do you want, Maggie? he asked with little emotion. The excitement and squeal of her voice caused Blaine to hold the phone away from his head for a moment. Oh my god, Blaine, it's Christine. You'll, you'll never believe it. She's opened her eyes today and just opened them. She sat up and stretched and yawned and she's back. I don't know how it happened, but she's awake and talking, and she thinks she's been asleep. Blaine was floored. His hands were shaking. Are you serious, Maggie? You're not fucking with me here? Never. Never about this. Oh, Blaine, thank you so much for defending her. I mean, Mum and Dad nearly fainted when she woke up. I mean... <laughs> thank you, Eisen, honey. I mean, to think we wanted to. Maggie was now weeping. Anyway, Blaine, hurry up and get your ass down here. She's been asking for you all morning, Maggie exclaimed. Of course. My God, of course. Just let me get my car. I'll be there in a few minutes. Happy Halloween, honey. Blaine hung up and bent over to get his shoes. He noticed they were already on his feet. Did he fall asleep with them? He didn't have time to care. Nor did he notice that there were bits of grass on his shoes and mud stains on his pants. He had no memory of the tent or of Mr Pinkerton. He only had a vague feeling of a strange nightmare. But now he was filled with far too much joy to think of anything. Other than getting to the hospital and seeing his wife again. Blaine climbed into his car and began to back out of his driveway when he noticed an item sitting on the passenger seat. It was a mug. A simple white mug it had a few cracks running through it, as if it had been shattered at some point. Inside of the mug was a folded note. Blaine read it. Don't forget the hot chocolate, Mr. Kellerman. And don't forget that you're one of the few men in the world that can say he did everything for the one he loved. Enjoy your life. Love your wife. Hail Tobit. Yours, Mr. Pinky. Blaine examined the note a moment longer. Tobit? Pinky. Sounded like something from a childhood daydream. Either way, he had no time to dwell on it. He backed up the driveway and drove to the hospital to see his wife. Damn, that that one was the one that knocked me out of the park for... That was where Mr. Pinkerton came from. That was his lovely, lovely um, origins, by the way. I said Tobit would be fair and he absolutely gave Blaine his due, even the asshole Pinkerton wants him to lose. But Blaine followed the rules. He did! Yes! Happy Halloween, Eisen. Oh, I'm so happy to hear it. Hello, Draconic. Hello, Hitoshi. Happy Halloween to you, darlings. I mean, that's true. 95% <laughs> done. Hells yeah. But the long origin tale of Mr. Pinkerton has actually dried out my throat for the day. Which also means our Halloween special is going to wind down for uh, another year. Very, very happy that you guys got to come and see this today. Let me pop on... Where are we going? There we go. And let's make sure that the lovely ending song that Manager Eisen has made is on here. <laughs> oh my goodness I hope you guys enjoyed our story time today that was much needed much much needed 
All right, shall we see who we're going to go see today? Hmm. Who have we not spent time with? Oh, Rika's playing today. From Perica. We can go see Rika today. I have not raided Rika in a long time, to be honest. <laughs> I hope you got to enjoy the actual origin stories of where my voice redeemed Mr. Pinkerton comes from. My little portly southern demon. <laughs> Honestly, I've had such a fun day today and a fun Halloween. It's, uh, you know, t taking my mind off of, you know, my surgery I had today on my arm. Um, and I love doing this for Halloween for everybody. Uh, what is Rika up to today though? She is doing a Halloween bash and we love Halloween because you know we have to be Pinkston is tonight's biggest loser. <laughs> that is true. That is true. But yeah she's also doing some Overwatch too. Please please come and join me in giving Rika lots of Halloween love today. Uh, it's one of our favorite holidays and honestly it you know i've got to get through the whole november phase of prepping for christmas <laughs> but i will be seeing you guys on what day are we on today tuesday friday um where we are back with sea of stars friday and saturday is our sea of stars day um so i'm super duper excited for that um, I'm going to enjoy uh, two days off, <laughs> two days I'm going to sleep, I'm going to relax and upload uh, stuff to YouTube and things like that, but I'm going to see you guys on Friday. I need to have another cup of tea and just like calm my vocal cords for today. But I hope you like this Halloween special <laughs> um, and I hope you get to stick around for the next one. Oh, I'm not a fan of hot chocolate, Chelsea. I like uh, I like my tea. <laughs> but I will see you guys on Friday on Twitch. Uh, but you'll find me in the Discord server um, tomorrow and Thursday for a little hangout. I know, I know. But go and give Rika lots of love. And it's goodbye from me, guys. Night-night.